You are listening to Breaking the Fourth Wall on Realm of the Mist Entertainment. What's up, guys? Chris Stolle here, back again with the return of Breaking the Fourth Wall. The idea behind this is that I thought Breaking the Fourth Wall could return in a format that I felt was most fitting for it. We don't really do one-on-one interviews on, on Realm of the Mist Entertainment in general, so I thought Breaking the Fourth Wall was the perfect format because we'd be breaking the fourth wall with speaking to people about their passions, their their projects, their interests, their hobbies, what, whatever the case may be. And with this rebirth, I can't think of anybody more perfect to be able to sit down and have a conversation with than published author and alumni of Realm of the Mist Entertainment about to release her third book. It's only like, what, two weeks away from her, her third book, Miss Kristen Stovall of the Song of Souls trilogy. Yay! You called me perfect, so I'm down with that. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's only it's supposed to release, I believe, August 15th, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Is that correct? Let's see, I've been yeah. paying attention. Coming right up. <clears throat> no pressure. <laughs> no pressure. How how you feeling coming up to the closer date? Uh, frantic, but I, we're the once we're past the last few finalizing details and tweaking the chapters, I'll feel less stressed out. But mostly frantic. <laughs> <laughs> but is, is, is it almost like a weight off your shoulder knowing that this trilogy is done? This is, this is about to release. The story has been told. It is. Today, though, it kind of hit me that, oh, God, it's over. I'm a little bit sad about this. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can always take a page out of Tolkien or, or uh, uh, Frank Herbert. And write all the offshoot books. <laughs> They're going to be offshoot books. It's going to happen. <laughs> There's already an off, like two in plan, like the planning stage. But I decided I'm going to give it a little bit of a break. You know, let myself say goodbye to these characters mentally and emotionally and then jump into it. I say that. And then like two weeks after the book comes out, I'll be like, well, time to start the next one. Well, again, I, I know we've discussed in previous shows the characters in, in your book, uh, the main protagonist. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm blanking her name at the moment. Uh, Aislinn. I, Aislinn, thank you. I, 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 I wanted to say Aslan, believe it or not. <laughs> like I was, but I'm sitting there like, no, Aslan's like, isn't that from like Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? You know, <laughs> that's Aslan. Yeah. 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 So I'm like I was confusing the two, but um, you know, have you ever thought of maybe taking uh, Aislinn? Into the into the like, I don't want to use the term prequel, but for lack of a better term, maybe the story of her and her husband before his demise. No, I've always very specifically, even before I started writing it, known that I only wanted to tell their story through flashbacks and memories. I never actually wanted to tell their story in a present sort of form, okay. and the prequel takes place at least a couple generations prior to the trilogy. Okay, it was just, it was just a thought, so that way you could spend more time with the characters, even though yeah. you've, you've, been writing, <laughs> you've been writing this trilogy for... I started in 2014? 2013? I'm not exactly sure the exact date I started writing or formulating the ideas, but I know that the book came out in 2014. So, so you're looking at at least five to six years mm-hmm. that you've been spending yeah. spending with these characters. So oh yeah, yeah, they're my it, friends. <laughs> it's almost like your children. <laughs> yeah, I'm <laughs> really protective of them, and you know I do love them on some level. You know, especially the ones you kill. Oh, no, no, yes. don't don't bring it up. No yeah. spoilers, no spoilers. I'm not going to spoil oh, the trilogy. I, I'm not saying one way or another who <laughs> dies, if they die, when they die. Will they die? No one knows except me and them. Or not them. <laughs> so I know you've been uh, promoting the book pretty hard. You just got done doing a uh, couple guest appearances on some other podcasts. Yeah, yeah. Correct? 
Yes, I appeared on the Hungry uh, Trilobite with Aaron, I hope I'm pronouncing his last name right, Bossig. And then I just recently recorded an interview with a show called Two Nerds and a Joke. And that will be coming out um, in August. They haven't given me a specific date yet, but they want to sort of time it closer to the book release. Okay. And then both shows said that they would like me to come back at some point. That's excellent. And I, I assume you've been kind of uh, almost, in a sense, in a book tour? Um, or, or you're to setting a, up for one? To a degree. That sort of... it's the, in, the book is coming out on the 15th, and you know school is starting, and things are getting really busy. So I'm actually looking at doing some, starting some of that in September. And then pending some other things, I might start doing the Comic-Con circuits. Nice. With that booth and stuff. Yeah. So. so what are the chances now when the book releases? Of course, we'd have to wait some time until it goes paperback and then and, and all that. But what are the chances of finally se- uh, selling it as a collector's set, all three books combined? There, I am planning on doing that. I'm going to be publishing hardbacks through Barnes & Noble. So the um, set will be something that I can put together, but I'm looking into the details because I can't find anyone that will do, like, they'll all do the three books, but then I'll have to be in charge of coming up with the cases, so that's kind of where I'm looking at. We haven't even begun designs for the the cases yet. Right now, it's just, let's get the book done. (laughs) Let's get everything ready. It goes, it's available, the, um, Kindle version will be available on August 1st for pre-order, not, I mean, so you can buy it, and then on August 15th, it will automatically download to your Kindle. Oh, very nice. How about yeah. how about audio versions of the book, you know, narrated by uh, Morgan Freeman and Tina Fey? <laughs> that would be the most amazing audio <laughs> version. Like, I just want those two to do an audio book together because that combination, no matter the book, could be amazing. Even if it was <laughs> the phone book. Just put those two together. Like, it would fly off the shelves, the... The metaphorical shelves. <laughs> that, that is true. Like, everybody always talks about, like, Morgan Freeman can narrate their lives. I think Samuel L. Jackson would be more per, uh, fitting for my life because you just need all the swear <laughs> words. But you, you, you could. You would be mesmerized by him just sitting there reading off, like, a, a Chine, uh, Morgan Freeman sitting there reading off a Chinese uh, takeout menu. <laughs> you would. You Mushu like, wow. chicken. <laughs> That's profound. <laughs> That's profound. <laughs> oh yeah, it'd be amazing. <laughs> Combination number twelve. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, eventually, I would like to move into audiobooks. I've kind of been waiting until all three are done to really seriously look into that. So we'll see. I, I just needed to get this part done before I could add another <laughs> level to it. Well, let, let let's play a little bit of the. Uh, uh, the game of the what ifs. When 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 it's time to sit down and talk about audiobooks, who would you want to be the reader slash narrator? Like who, if I could pick anybody. The, yeah, if you could pick anybody, who would who would be the voice of Aislin? Oh gosh, what is her name? Okay, so I can't remember the name of the voice actress. But she voices the Imperial agent in Star Wars The Old Republic. She has a phenomenal, like, just the most lovely speaking voice. She would be amazing. <laughs> I Google that now. That's what Got I was just phone. about to do. <laughs> See, now we have to know. Yeah, that now we have to know. So, uh, Star Wars The Old Republic. Well, while, while I'm looking it up, because uh, I don't want to kill the ebb and flow of the uh, conversation. Right. Why don't we go ahead and have you give a, just a, a quick little synopsis reminder of, of the story thus far for people that may not be listening and that may not be totally uh, caught up with, with your Song of Souls trilogy. Uh, the premise of the trilogy is that there's this young woman who's widowed very suddenly and tragically without children. You know, she basically goes from a newlywed to a widow. And... Through that tragedy is thrown into events that are so much bigger than anything she ever imagined. She gains a a connection to her deceased husband because they were soulmates and he died so suddenly and so unexpectedly that their souls actually sort of bonded with one another 
and and sort of clung to one another. So she can see him and speak to him, and so can other women like her who are soul bound, and it creates magical healing abilities. So she goes and trains with them, and then ends up on this huge sort of out of control adventure that seems simple and figured out in the beginning but ends up going so much deeper and actually was something that started long before she was ever even born there you go and again i I wanted to stay away from i wanted to stay away from uh Spoilers. Spoiler, spoilers to book three were obviously just like with any trilogy. The story is set up in one, everything goes to hell in two, but then the story wraps in three. So I really don't want to, like, I want to know, but I don't want to ruin it for everybody. Right. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. And that's when people ask for a synopsis, I have to go back and go, okay, how can I give a synopsis if they've only ever read the first book or they haven't even done that or they're waiting for the third book? And I have to, that's kind of a brain teaser for me because I would be the world's worst about spoilers because I'm excited and want to tell everybody everything. So the Imperial officer you were trying to think of, was it Captain Fora? Um, it's the Imperial Agent's voice, and she was voiced by, um... Because there is a lot of people who did voices for Old Republic. Oh, yeah, if you just look up female Imperial Agent voice, that would be the one to go with, the, the look up to do. Counselor, Jedi Knight, female, Imperial Agent female, Joe Wyatt. Yes, Joe Wyatt, that's now I rec- you know, I remember... She would be amazing and phenomenal. I, yeah. I just, I love her performance she in al- that game. In this picture in IMDb, she almost looks a little bit like River from uh, Firefly. Oh, <laughs> the actress, awesome. the voice actress. That's so, kind of amazing. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, well, the big question now, obviously, besides the book tour uh, and getting the sales out there, uh, obviously you want to get the sales of the first two books for people so they can learn right. about the third book. So, you know, uh, any specials going on? I know for a while that uh, they were doing uh, 99 Cent on Amazon for, for Soulbound. Soulbound was 99 Cents on Amazon through the month of June. Right now, Soul Fire is 99 Cents through the month of July. And then actually... Starting August 1st, Soulbound and Soulfire will go back on 99 cents, um, probably through the month of August, just so that it's a little easier for people to afford to get the whole trilogy if they want. Oh, absolutely. And uh, besides besides that, uh, any particular places that the books are going to start showing up? Like you mentioned that you got a deal in the works with Barnes & Noble. You can order them on Barnes & Noble's site. You can go to a store and order them through the store. The thing with like the, the big retailers is oftentimes they really only carry like the stuff that is really already out there on the best sellers lists and everything because they have limited shelf space. So it's sort of kind of a catch-22 for the people struggling to make it big. You know, you can't get your book physically in stores because, of course, they want to reserve the shelf space for the stuff that people are coming in for every single day. Yeah, I didn't I didn't want to be a, uh, sound like a jerk about it, but basically the, <laughs> the bigger name authors, oh, yeah. George R.R. Oh, yeah. R. Martin, Stephen mm-hmm. King, uh, right. you know, D.C. Andrews, so, stuff like that. Exactly. Gets, gets the shelf space, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's It's a frustration. But the books are picking up. There are some bookstores locally that carry it. Um, there are a lot of bookstores owned by, you know, just individuals that will often be open to carrying books. There's a possibility that it will be carried uh, somewhere in Missouri. Uh, I don't want to give any specifics because those things are all still in the works, but a, a place in Missouri might start carrying it soon. So that's definitely awesome. Um, with it being a fantasy genre book, um, have you ever thought of putting it into places like comic shops or even like game stores that deal with like Dungeons and Dragons, Magic the Gathering 
maybe try to get a deal with, with uh, shops and, and stores like that. You know, that had never occurred to me, but that's a really good idea. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It just like never even ticked off in my head that that was a possibility, even though I do comic cons and that's all mashed together there. Have you, I know, I know you're a comic con person. You, you like going to rent fairs and, and comic cons and, and sci-fi cons and all. I, I saw you, I saw you dressed up as killer frost. Oh yeah. <laughs> recently. That was fun. So fun. <laughs> a lot of work, <laughs> but fun. Have you had any luck, uh, peddling the book, uh, at cons or have you not tried to cre- uh, cross that threshold yet? I've not tried to cross that threshold yet. At the beginning, I made the decision to wait until the entire trilogy was out to start doing a lot of physical location booths, particularly anything that would have a higher overhead cost, which a Comic-Con is going to. I've done some things on a smaller scale that had a very low overhead, and I did fairly well with them, and it was fun. I, I enjoy being able to talk to readers and and to talk to people in general because the books are so tied in with my own story that I feel like that's something that w- when a person knows it it I don't know I hope it heightens their reading experience oh absolutely and I don't mean I don't mean to sound like she's selling her book out of like the, the, <laughs> a, a CD van in the parking lot somewhere <laughs> or, or something like that but I mean like I, I, I'm envisioning I'm envisioning her struggle with, with her books and her books are good I have read the first one, I'm in the middle of reading the second one. Oh, yay! <laughs> yeah, I finally got my hands on the Kindle. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> Double. So, for years, I've been waiting to get my hands on the Kindle, which is where we had book two. So I finally was able to, like, okay, I'm reading this freaking book. Um, yeah. So, you but know, two I gave, is darker. Two is darker. It's definitely darker. And, uh,. <laughs> When I've finished it, I'll, I'll, I'll do the same courtesy I did for uh, Soulbound for you and give you a review. Um, <laughs> <laughs> There's always that, yay, unless not good. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm actually, Doesn't matter. I'll say, I'm I'll, always questioning it. <laughs> I'm not overly deep into it yet, but I will say I'm enjoying it better than the first one. Oh, good, good. A lot of people have said that. The first one, in so many ways, was an introduction. It's the same with a lot of trilogies. The first book is often more of an introduction to the world and the ideas than and kind of setting up for the plot than it actually is anything sort of complete. No, you're absolutely right. You're getting to know the characters. You're getting to know the struggle that they're about to go on. And, yeah. you know, that that's usually book one. So book two, like like I said, using using the, the Star Wars reference of the original trilogy, act two is always where everything goes to hell. <laughs> it really is. So, <laughs> hence the Empire Strikes Back. So Which is you, one of my favorites. <laughs> yeah. It's everybody's favorite. It's, it's the act that everything goes to crap. So yeah. now you just want to see who makes it out of it to, to be able to, to <laughs> you know, right. live the fight another day, if you will. Yeah. You know, but uh, no, I mean, finally got my hands on book two. So I, I'm reading it. I'm not completed yet. So I'm not going to give I'm not going to give an overall, you know, feeling of it. But I, I am enjoying it more. Than I did the first one, and it's not not to say that I didn't no. enjoy the first one. You I, can go I didn't back. read it that way at all. <laughs> no, I'm saying I'm saying it for the listeners. Right. Go back, go back into previous uh, breaking the fourth wall episodes because I believe it was breaking the fourth wall that I I uh, yes gave gave my review. <clears throat> go into previous breaking the fourth wall episodes, you'll find my review of Soulbound. So, <laughs> but uh, also, guys, just to let you know that you know, as I stated in the intro. Kristen is a member of Realm of the Mist Entertainment, so <laughs> she will be eventually coming back to the podcasts <laughs> once she's done right. doing p- pushing her book, yeah, you know, <laughs> and all. But uh, w- the reason I was stating that is that on the bottom of the screen, you can see that you know, we have our website up. You can go to the merchandise page right now and go and order her books. Both, uh, I believe, we have you uh, set up on Amazon. Uh, the Amazon link, as well as I believe the Kindle, which is basically the same thing. Right. The Ke- yeah. Kindle link is is uh, link is there as well, so you can go to our website right now and go order her books. Yes, please do. It would make me so happy. <laughs> 
So that way we can get her out of that CD van in the parking lot. No. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> smells like cheese. <laughs> now back back when I was a musician, I just I, I, that's kind of what I'm comparing it to with what you're doing with right now, is that uh, I'm remembering like standing outside of major concerts selling demos. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like it, 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 it's, it's all it, on you. Yeah, it, it's all on you to get get the the knowledge out there. And I mean, yeah, you got the backing of publishers, and you do have, uh, you know, some some major uh, merchandise book merchandisers and stuff like that, um, helping to sell your book, i.e., Amazon, Barnes and Noble online. Yeah. But it's still like like you said, even though your name is not Stephen King. You still exactly. have to go out and do the legwork. So, guys, exactly. help get this book out there. Word of mouth is a wonderful thing to independent artists in any way, shape, or form. And it's, reviews on Amazon are worth their weight in gold. They're really, really important. Reviews, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, anywhere you can leave book reviews, it's just it's so vital. For books or music or any kind of art, That really, it's that word of mouth that just it helps break through. Absolutely. Um, again, not to, not to draw comparisons, but when I was a musician, I used to, I used to book my band all the time in battle of the bands, not because I ever expected to win. I knew that was a popularity contest. Whoever brought the most people is going to win. Oh yeah. (laughs) You know what I mean? But I, so my band asked me one time, why do we do these when we know we're not going to win? We don't have the fan base that they do. I said, because their fans are hearing us. Somebody is digging what we did, and we just gained five, six, seven new fans. Exactly. It's getting your sound out there, your face out there, just getting your art form out there, and it's it's so vital. Mm-hmm. So, guys, word of mouth is a wonderful thing, whether you go on and give a review on Amazon or BarnesandNoble.com, whether you're just pushing it out there on your social medias, uh, you know, or get, write a blog. If you're a blog writer, write a blog and hashtag Kristen Stovall or Song of Souls trilogy on it. Get the word out there and let people know what this book series is and what it's about. It really helps out Kristen Stovall. And, really does. you know, <laughs> there's never anything bad about that. No. But, uh, no. but the big que- the big question here before we close out this interview, the biggest question. I know you got the book, uh, the book tour, and everything coming up. <laughs> right. But once the dust settles from book three, yes. What's next? Uh, the plan, unless inspiration strikes elsewhere more strongly, is to do something of a prequel. And I say something of a prequel in that it will have some tie-ins to this trilogy, but I want it to also be its its own story, and it takes place a couple generations before. I will say one character, one, that we've heard of, met, is planned to be in that book. Well, here's the big question on that, then, since we're talking about a, a spin-off slash prequel. One-off book or another trilogy? This one is a one-off book. Okay. So a standalone story on, in one book. Mm-hmm. Nice. Yes. Yes. Just one standalone story. I want to continue to build the world, but I'm a big fan of world building when it's done within the context of the story, when you see the world expanding as you see the characters. I don't want to read a whole prologue about a city and how it was built and all of that I want to learn as I go I want to learn with the characters and so that's how I write that well speaking of how you how you write how let, let's uh, let's dig into that a little bit for aspiring writers you know or, or even failing ones like myself once in a while <laughs> Okay, maybe you want to let us in a little bit on your technique, some of your some of your disciplines that you use to be able to not just put out one but three books. Well, first and foremost, very important, coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so much coffee. <laughs> My brain is fueled by caffeine and coffee. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think for me the 
biggest part was just deciding to do it and then absolutely sticking with it. And I have to give credit to another author, Neo Edmund, who I learned recently was also a putty on Power Rangers, which is just unbelievably cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, I met him at a Comic-Con and I was telling him, oh, you're doing what I want to do. And he just looked at me and he went, so do it. <laughs> and I was like, oh, right, just do it. And I, I, since having books come out and everything, I realize every time you tell people you're a published author, one of the first things out of their mouth is, oh, I wanted to write a book or I had a, an idea for a book. And after a while, you're just like, oh, great. Because of, and you're just thinking because it's that easy, <laughs> just you, everyone can do it. Because <laughs> when you're in a bad mood, you think the grouchy thoughts. Well, no, but I you can... do hear it all the time. Um, so I saw him again at a comic con recently, and we were talking because we've kind of kept in touch. And he says, "As far as I know, you're the first person that I said that to who actually did just do it." <laughs> So that that was a big part of it. Well, that that's definitely why we're all of us here not at Realm of the Misunderstanding. Not just myself, even though I'm constantly, Kristen, let's talk about your books. You know, but, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, everybody here is so proud of you for what you've done, and oh, I I get I get speak from firsthand knowledge. Writing is not easy. No. Um, I'm in the middle of trying to write two books. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Kristen, Kristen knows about this. One I was working on for years for another f mutual friend of ours. Yeah. And one that I got inspired to do because of one of the other shows that we do here at Realm of the Mist. And the one that's inspired by one of the shows here, I'm actually up to 10,000 words. Wow. So I, I've that actually good. I, I've actually put some effort into it. Uh, the other book, I've got about seven pages. <laughs> it's not well, easy. It is that not one's easy. not really your book as much, though, you know, because it kind of came from someone else. So I could see how it'd be much harder to write that. <laughs> um, yeah, I didn't actually know about the second book. Yeah, I tried to get you to read the uh, synopsis that I that I wrote, but oh, you were, I did you were read it, didn't I? Yes, no, I think you I did. I well, did. I, I sent it to you, but I didn't know if you had a chance to read it. Okay, I don't remember honestly. It, it, the last few months have just been a blur. <laughs> you know, it, it, it was a Dungeon and Dragons fantasy, so... Okay, yeah. No, I I don't remember what I did last week. <laughs> so, <laughs> everything is just editing and going, did that comma go there? No. No, that's not a place for a comma. Yes, is it? Is it a place for a comma? <laughs> this word is stupid. No, it was good. Uh, I'll no, tell you what, one of, one of the worst enemies I have is when I'm writing things, and I'm trying to come up with these places and all that, because... You know, I'm basing it on an old campaign, Dungeons and Dragons campaign, but because I don't want it to exist in pre-existing Dungeons and Dragons worlds, I'm changing the names of everything. Oh God, finding names. Exactly, and one of the worst enemies I ever had with using a word processor is goddamn spell check. <laughs> <laughs> the great thing with Microsoft Word is that you can put the name in, then highlight it, right-click, and click Add to Dictionary. And then it comes up as one of the words. What's not, not great is when your computer wipes and you have to reinstall Word and lose all of those, which happened to me toward the end of the book. Oh, no. Not as bad as what happened with Soulbound. <laughs> now, the, 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 the processor I use, uh, WPS word mm -hmm. processor uh, i forget exactly what it's called uh they they have that function too but i mean it's just it's just the battle like every time you're typing and you start I'm, I'm sure you go through this where you where you just start going like uh i i want to i want to say i numb to what you're typing <laughs> oh yeah oh, where yeah. you know it's just letters to you but you know you're typing it right and then all of a sudden you see that annoying ass little red squiggly line underneath the word. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. you don't know if it's because you spelled it wrong or if it's because of word you made up or. <laughs> right. Yeah. So and then what gets bad when you're writing a trilogy is you get to the third book and you start to incorporate some things that you put in the first book, knowing you were going to use them now, and then start going, crud, what did I name that person? What was that thing called? Go back. Is it in the chapter? <laughs> you know? I don't know how George R. R. Martin does it because 
I don't have nearly as many characters as he does, and half the time I forget what I named some of them. I've got a, I've got a cheat sheet, uh, which is actually on the first page of the book, but I have it set aside for me that tells me the name and uh, job class, whatever, of each character in the book, and then I have a cheat sheet for all the places I want the characters to go to in the yeah, book. That's- I should do that. I always think it when I run into the I didn't remember their name, and then I don't do it. So, so every, you know, write a trilogy, just do it. I can jump on that. Write down notes to keep track of it. No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is I think of doing those things when I'm in the middle of writing a chapter, and then by the time I finish, I don't want to write anything for a little while because I'm done for the day. That's it. You're absolutely right. But I mean, and I'm a I'm a failure, you know, as as a uh, as a writer. I'm just doing this to see if I can, you know. You you put the work and time in. You know? <laughs> yeah. I, I've done what I can. I just the the writing part on some levels is so much easier than the getting it out there part, because I'm the one in charge of writing. I have absolute control. It is my world. I am the god of the world, and they will do mostly what I say. <laughs> Sometimes right. they tell me no, but usually what I say. <laughs> but then, you know, getting it out there, I can't just be like, you will buy the book, and then they listen. Some people listen. I like those people. <laughs> the ones that don't Others... listen, they're the ones that die in this book. <laughs> <laughs> then there's a lot of, like, we, we all get busy, and I think there are a lot of people who intend to buy it, and then they just get busy, and by the time they're where they can it slips their mind i know i'm guilty of that all the time and then actually finding the time to read a book once you've got it it's just let's well, see that that's that's why we got to start talking to morgan freeman and tina fey <laughs> get those audio books made exactly exactly or was it joe wyatt wasn't that her name yeah, joe wyatt yeah we, we have to talk to her we need gotta, her to do it need her to get on board here got to get her to do that yeah <laughs> Or, uh, or, oh my God! What was the name of the uh, girl who played the Russian commander in the fourth Indiana Jones movie? Famous uh, actress, Kate Blanchett. Kate, get Kate to do it. Yeah, I mean, she was in <laughs> Lord of the Rings, so it's in my head. You yeah, know. <laughs> get Kate to do it. <laughs> Kate also is amazing. So in everything she does, she's always amazing. Yes, even even a snaker like the fourth Indiana Jones movie. She was good in it, though. She was still good. So, <laughs> She look, was fun. Look, with the fourth Indiana Jones movie, Harrison Ford was great. Clay, uh, Kate Blanchett was great. Uh, uh, the one who plays Miriam, I forget her name off the top of my head. I never remember her name either, but I know her face. She was great. The movie itself was acted well, minus it was Shia the, LaBeouf. It was just a stupid idea. <laughs> it was the Yeah, it was the writing. Why... No one in that writer's room went, uh, we don't do aliens with Indiana Jones. I don't know. It's like, it, it was just crazy. It didn't work. No. Just, it was too much of a departure from the formula that did work. Right. Nazis and, uh, usually, usually some, uh, Jewish religious. Yeah. <laughs> Something that tied in with archaeology, which was ancient civilizations and ancient beliefs and ancient lore and the crystal skulls really aren't and the whole alien thing really is not <laughs> you know well, I mean, somebody was watching too met too much of the um history channel show about aliens <laughs> <laughs> that guy with the funky hair. That guy, hair. everything, everything aliens. in an ancient hieroglyph <laughs> means aliens. And I'm just like, it looks like a bunny. Do they not have bunnies then? Because I'm pretty <laughs> sure that's a bunny and not an alien. That is not E.T. It's a bunny. Right. Maybe Alf. <laughs> oh, Alf. Uh, we, the, the, this is this is this is an interview. I can't I can't go off on tangents about entertainment. Uh, <laughs> right. But but to be fair, I mean I mean Crystal Skull went a departure from archaeology, but technically so did Temple of Doom. Yeah, but also most people don't think that's one of the better Indiana Jones movies either. Kalima. <laughs> <laughs> I mean I don't think that's listed as one of the best Indiana Jones movies. No. So, I just know, as a little kid, it scared the daylights out of me. Oh, man, up until I was a teenager, I couldn't watch the part where he actually dug into the dude's chest and pulled out his heart. 
Like I would leave the room until the, the till that scene was over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was pretty bad. <laughs> but I also did the same thing in Raiders of the Lost Ark when when they opened the ark and all the Nazis would like melt. <laughs> Their faces melted off. Yeah. 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 Now one, I find it funny. That one's but back then it I don't think me I've out. actually ever watched Temple of Doom as an adult. I think like it was enough to know how much it disturbed me. There were like eyeballs in soup that like turned and looked up at people and that was it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Crazy. Maybe that was maybe my mind is mixed in something else in with that, but I swear there were eyeballs in soup that turned and looked at people. <laughs> To see what happens, ladies and gentlemen, you get disturbed by movies and, and science fiction and fantasy, and you wind up writing your own book. <laughs> so now everybody's going to go out and really freak their kids out with horror movies. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> You'll be creative, or that's, else. <laughs> that's, that, that's borderline child abuse. I have a twenty-three yeah. year, I have a twenty-three year old son who his uh, kind of stepfather. When he was a young kid, sat him down at like nine years old to watch Child's Play. Twenty-three-year-old man still won't watch that movie anymore. <laughs> That's not. Yeah, no, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't watch things with kids that they're not ready to see. Not that I have kids. It just seems kind of like a no-brainer. Like if they're not ready to see it, don't make them watch it. It'll scar them. Yeah, it's it's kind of it's kind of border borderline uh, child abuse. You're gonna watch this. Yeah. Or else. <laughs> like my, or else we're getting you a Chucky doll. <laughs> my youngest had nightmares for three days because on YouTube he found a, a video of SpongeBob SquarePants and all of a sudden he got demonic red eyes. Oh, God. I don't oh, think no. I'm going to be showing him Nightmare on Elm Street anytime soon. Yeah. No. Oh, I don't think that... I don't think he's ready for that. Although, <laughs> Seems like something to wait on. <laughs> although I did sit him and his sister down uh, a couple weeks ago for the first time and they watched Monster Squad. <laughs> and now I have a nine year old kid running around yelling, Kick Wolfman in the Nards. So oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> God love the eighties. Alright, so <laughs> definitely definitely going off the rails here a little bit. Uh one more time just uh, for the the aspiring uh people out there who who obviously this is this is a dream of yours. Yes. You know, to, to be an, a published author, to complete this trilogy that has been swimming around in your head for the last six years or more. You yeah. know, what advice do you give somebody just starting out, whether it be a writer, a painter, a musician, whatever? They've got this idea, this 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 yearning in, in their heart and, and this, this buzzing in their head that they just don't understand how to get it out. What advice would you give to those people? Just write or play the music or paint the painting and don't worry about whether or not it's perfect. Just do it. You're not going to be perfect the first time. I'm not perfect. That's why I have an editor. Just do what you're passionate about. Just do it. The, the act of doing it is huge. You will grow as an artist if you do it. But if you don't do it, you will never grow as an artist and you will never develop your your art form or your trade you have to just do it and enjoy it if you put so much pressure on yourself that you're not enjoying it then what's the point you know do it and enjoy it and if you don't feel like doing it at that particular moment or you're not enjoying it or something isn't working right you know the way you had it planned step away go do something else for me when i'm having trouble writing I'll just go write something else. I'll go write Star Wars fan fiction. I don't put it up anywhere, but it's there and it's this little outlet for me. Just do it. That's like like Neo Edmund said, just do it. Well, to use, a, to use a quote from one of my favorite directors and writers, uh, great arts of work are never completed, only abandoned. <laughs> That's true. George Lucas. <laughs> yeah. Of course, he went back and changed his trilogy how many times? Um. <laughs> any, any time. There's always, I still kind of think, oh, I wish I had done this or I wish I had done that. And I'm, I'm always going to think that there's something wrong with it. I'm always going to think that it could be better. I just, I have to get out of my own head. I trust my editor. 
She's very good. She tells me when I'm doing something wrong. She tells me when I'm doing something right. And she'll tell me when something is just flat out stupid. <laughs> and sometimes <laughs> she'll use that. No, this is stupid. Fix it. But I appreciate that. That's another thing. Have someone who will give you honest, constructive criticism and ignore people who give just negative, destructive criticism. Constructive is good. It's helpful. You grow and you learn. Critics, just to be critics, don't don't worry about it. They're just somebody who's who didn't enjoy it for whatever reason or didn't have a good day or don't want it and you can't let it bother can't let it bother you. There's well, no art form or book. It's nothing that everybody likes. Well, I was going to say, it kind of falls under um, bo both sides of the category, too. Not just the critic, the naysayer critics, but also the yes men you want to avoid, I would oh, think. Yeah. Because they would lead you down the wrong path. Maybe their, inten their intentions are pure, but leading you down the wrong path, constantly hearing, yes, that's a good idea, go with that, instead of, no, that right. probably wouldn't work. That's why you have to have that. Yeah. <laughs> That's why you have to have that constructive criticism person who will just fly, like bluntly tell you, no, this is stupid, fix it. But they're <laughs> saying it from they want you to succeed. They know you can do better. Exactly. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask Kristen to uh, let you guys know where you can find out more about her, find out about her books, find out where you can uh, order the books, obviously, besides listening to the podcast. And I will put the links in the descriptions down below. But, of course, Kristen has some social media outlets for, uh, for you guys to contact as well if you have any other questions or concerns with the books. Kristen, take it away. All right, you can find me on Facebook on the Song of Souls Trilogy fan page. If you just go into the search bar and search Song of Souls Trilogy, you'll find it. It's got a nice, pretty purple picture from the cover of the third book right now. Uh, I am on there as well, but the better way is to follow the page first and message me there first because there has been a string of strangers sort of and not like these are fans of the book, but like it's one of those things where it's the weird people from, um, like the, the weird men from foreign countries that you approve it, and then they immediately start asking you out, and then it gets awkward. So I, I'm a little more hesitant to just blindly approve friend requests now. But if you go on the Song of Souls page, send a message or like stuff, I'll respond. That's also the best place for news. I have a website. If you just Google Kristen Stovall Books, the website should come up. I also have a Twitter account. You can follow me there. I am not as active there just because word limits are not good for descriptive writers. They drive us insane. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm also on Instagram. And guys, and with like, sorry, Twitter and Instagram, just Kristen Stovall. And guys, remember, like she said with the uh, Song of Souls uh, uh, fan page, it is a fantasy book fan group. Do not, I repeat, do not send dick pics and claim it's a magic wand. Oh, Nobody God. wants to or see a that. Or wizard staff. Or a wizard staff. <laughs> Have some tact, okay? <laughs> I mean, those will just... I've got moderators and, and admins. Those will just be deleted immediately. <laughs> So I think I may have some safeguards against that sort of thing as well. I, I hope so, because I, I, I've heard too many horror stories from so many people that aren't even publishers or, or actors or actresses or whatever getting that stuff just from straight perverts. Uh, you know what yeah. I mean? So if you're, if you're going to go check out Kristen Stovall's stuff, make sure it's because you're interested in her writing. Don't waste her time or ruin the experience for the actual fans. By being a douche is all I'm saying. Right. Or get your accounts, you know, ruined, <laughs> shut down and blocked because I have zero tolerance for that and I will contact Facebook. <laughs> all right, guys. And, of course, you can find me right here on the fourth wall or wherever any of the Realm of the Mist Entertainment uh, podcasts can be heard right here on YouTube. Like, share, comment, subscribe, Anchor, iTunes, all that. Give us a follow. Give us a review. Give us a five star and, of course, go check out our Patreon page. Guys, any support will help keep these shows running for you guys because without you, there is no us. Again, I want to thank my guest, Kristen Stovall, who will be returning to Realm of the Mist eventually. 
Yes, <laughs> when I'm not completely brain fried. Well, we told her that when she started work on the third book and, and the whole entire journey through the third book, her spot was for there for her when she was ready to return. That and offer has, in. And that, and and that offer has not expired <laughs> so <Yay. laughs> she will be she will be back to talk nerdy stuff with us again as soon as she's done wrapping up quite honestly can we call this basically your life's work yeah although i thus do far. intend to keep going yeah thus far <laughs> yeah my life's work thus far. <laughs> thus far hopefully i have plenty of life left <laughs> as, as, as long as you don't keep people waiting like george R. R. martin when is that sixth book coming? I mean, I already felt bad with a two-year wait between the second and third. <laughs> <laughs> when is dance? What, 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 what is it? When's winter? When is when's a winter coming? <laughs> uh, Fifty years from now, they'll still be asking that question. I, d d does uh, Martin have children? I don't know. I have to look that up because if he does, it's probably going to wind up being like a Frank Herbert situation. Oh, yeah. George dies and his son takes over. <laughs> <laughs> well, knock on wood that the, at least the ending will come and the ending of the show will not be what we're left with. Oh, God, not Brand of Bro Broken. Can can Aisling kill Brand of Broken? <laughs> I mean, I bet she could. I don't know that she would. Would she, she please? <laughs> that, that's my request for the next book. I mean, that's, that's kind of villain-like right there. He's in a wheelchair. <laughs> that's okay. I'm sure the Red Keep is not handicap accessible. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> How do they deal with the stairs, I wonder? <laughs> that's a conversation. For now I'm sitting day. here trying to figure this out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you for tuning in to Breaking the Fourth Wall. I will catch you on the next one. Have a good night, guys.